Welcome back to our class on reaching new levels of faith. So we've talked so far about reasons why we should want to develop our faith. And I hope you have come up with your reason, your motivation for wanting to grow in your faith. We also learned in our last class about what faith is. And I hope you have a good grasp as we're talking about faith, what that is. There's another definition of faith that we didn't really talk about, and that is our belief system itself. We call it the faith. The Bible talks about the faith. That's not one that we're really dealing with here. Our, our faith, our beliefs, our doctrines, those are important, but we're, we're talking more here about our levels of trust in God, our faith in God, and that's what we're developing here. And so there are five basic levels of faith, and we're going to answer the question, what are those different levels of faith? I wanna do two things with you. The first thing I wanna do is walk you through, or I'll just define the five levels of faith. And then I'm gonna give you biblical examples of each one. So again, if you happen to be able to be sitting down and you can get a Bible in front of you, you can be turning that to the book of Acts chapter eight. That's where we will begin and hopefully you have a student workbook and you're able to follow along in the notes there as well. So let's get into it. Here are the five basic levels of faith just by definition, all right? The first level of faith is called imitating faith. Imitating faith is where I don't understand, I just do what you do. We're essentially talking about the faith of a child here. A child doesn't really understand what we're doing when we're taking the Lord's Supper and, and all this stuff and putting money in the offering. They just watch it and they want to imitate, but there's not a level of understanding there. They watch and they repeat. It's still faith, but it's faith at its most basic level. And I'll talk more about that here in a little bit. The second level of faith is affiliating faith. Affiliating faith is I understand, but I still only do what I'm doing because others do it. In other words, because of my affiliation with other people. I believe these things. I go to this church, this church believes this, therefore I believe this. There is an understanding involved where, yeah, I understand this is why we take the Lord's Supper, this is why we put money in the offering, this is why we fast, etc., etc but I haven't really searched out and owned this. I just see others doing it, and my faith, my system of belief, is based on who I affiliate with. The third level of faith is searching faith. And searching faith is the most important step that we make in our faith journey, and I'll be spending more time than, on that one than any of the others, really. Searching faith is where I'm going to check this out for myself. You say, I believe this long enough, but I've never really searched out the scriptures to own this faith for myself. I'm going to do that. I'm going to make myself check this out. I was taught this about the book of Revelation, for instance. Well, I've never really studied Revelation. I've just been told this is what it's about. I need to search that out. Or any number of stuff, the, the Holy Spirit. I, I don't really know, and so I'm going to search that out. That is an important step in our faith development, but it's not the last step. In fact, there's two more. The next one, the fourth level of faith, is solidifying faith. And that's where you're basically saying, let me piece this all together. I've searched my faith. But now, after I've searched for a while, I need to start solidifying. I, start, I need to make it solid. And I always get this where people say, well, don't we search our whole lives? Well, of course we search our whole lives. But if you don't go through this period of faith where you say, I'm going to come down solid. I've searched this out. I either believe it or I don't believe it. If you don't ever reach that level, then you just search and search and search to no avail. It doesn't accomplish anything. You have to get to a point where you say, okay, Here's what it says. I've studied each of these issues. I believe this or I don't believe it. You need to make your faith solid. And then that's really what leads to the fifth and final step, and that is mature faith. Mature faith is when you are to that point that nothing is going to stop you from following God. You can say what you want to me. You can call me anything. You can throw me in jail. You can do whatever you want. 
I am not going to stop following God. Mature faith is not perfection. And I'll talk about that when we get to that section. But mature faith is where you are resilient and you are mature, you're strong in your faith. That is the highest level of faith and it should be the goal of every single Christian. Now, what I need you to do, and this is an important step, I need you to memorize these five levels of faith. Imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, mature faith. I need you to memorize those five levels of faith. And maybe you're saying, well, I'm just terrible at memorizing. We're, not look we're looking at five words just with faith after it. And so if you can learn these, we're going to be talking about these levels. And it's important for you to be able to recall these in your mind as we're going through them. And we'll be going back and forth and referring to them. Imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, mature faith, whatever method you have to use to memorize those, please do that. They don't make a good acronym. And as I said before, these are just, I made these words up 35 years ago, except for mature faith. That one's obviously in the Bible. But the others I just made up because it fits the, the level that we're talking about. But if you'll take the time to memorize those five levels of faith, that will very much help you as we're moving forward with our class. So those are the five levels of faith. Now, each of these is in the Bible, and I want to show you biblical examples of each one of them. So the first one is imitating faith. Imitating faith is the hardest one to find in the Bible because, as I already stated, imitating faith is basically the faith of a child. I don't understand. I just do what you do. The Bible really doesn't give examples of the mindsets of children. It talks about children, yes, but it doesn't really have characters that are children where it really develops. And so we have to go to an adult. And there's really not an adult that has imitating faith unless it would be Simon the sorcerer. Simon had a faith that was based on what others were doing and he didn't really understand. Let's read the text here in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 9. It says, Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and was astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. Now we don't know what kind of magic he did. If he really had supernatural ability, he certainly didn't get it from God. He might have got it from, from Satan, but he didn't have it from God. He could have been just uh, magicians like we have today. They're sleight of hand and they know tricks and maybe that was the way. We don't really know for sure. But he was astonishing the people. That we do know. Verse 10 says, And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This is the man that is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But... When they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So here is Simon, and he is astonishing the people. But when he sees Philip, and Philip's, he's not a knockoff. He's not, he's not doing uh, tricks here. This is the real thing. And so Simon is very much impressed. And everybody else gets baptized, and it says Simon himself believes, and he also gets baptized. Let's see what happens next here. When the apostles... In Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Probably need to stop there and explain what's going on. Philip was not an apostle. He was an evangelist. He was a minister. And so he had the miraculous gifts, but he was not able to transfer the miraculous gifts. Only the apostles had the ability to lay their hands on other people and pass on the miraculous gifts. And so Peter and John are sent down to Samaria when they hear that the word of God is spread down there. And when they're praying for them that they would receive the Holy Spirit, it's not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
which we receive at baptism. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, not the miraculous gifts. There's one Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4. But there are different manifestations of that Spirit. There's the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit that we receive at baptism. And then there was miraculous gifts. The apostles were able to transfer the miraculous gifts to others by the laying on of their hands. And they recognize that. Simon recognizes that in verse 17. It says, Then they began laying hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit, meaning the miraculous gifts. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. When Simon saw what the apostles were able to do, not only did he want the miraculous gifts, he wanted the ability to lay hands on other people so he could transfer the miraculous gifts. He obviously didn't understand. And so that's why I say he's probably the best example in the Bible of imitating faith. I don't understand. I just do what you do. And I'm not questioning his salvation because you can come to Christ with imitating faith and still be saved. But his level of faith is obviously very, very low. And Peter rebukes him for even thinking he could purchase the miraculous gifts. So that's what imitating faith looks like. I don't really understand. I just imitate. I just do what others do. Let's look at the second level of faith in biblical examples. Now this would be affiliating faith. And our example is going to be the townspeople in John chapter 4. As you're turning there, you may remember John chapter 4 is where Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman. Talks to her about living water. Talks to her about her living condition, which she really doesn't want to talk about all that much. Uh, she prefers to talk about worship. They talk about that for a little while. And then let's skip down to oh, verse uh, 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. And at this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with the woman. Yet no one said, what do you speak? What do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? And so the woman left her water pot. Notice that. That's the reason she went was to get water. Forget that. That's not important anymore. She left the water pot. She went into the city and she said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out from the city and were coming to him. Now think about the townspeople. The Samaritan woman comes and says, come see this man. He, he told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? I don't know. Maybe it is. Come see for yourself. At that point, they have affiliating faith. Their faith is based on their affiliation with the Samaritan woman. And that's what affiliating faith is. They haven't really searched out. They don't really know Christ for themselves. They just know based on what they've been told through this affiliative relationship. Let's skip down to verse 39 and let's see what happens next. It says, From, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman. Now there's affiliating faith. Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. Many more believed because of his word, meaning Jesus' word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. You see the transformation that took place from there. They said, now, we believed initially because of what you said to the Samaritan woman, but not anymore. We have heard him, and now we believe because of what he has said. Now, I want to give you an illustration here. Let's let this, uh, this man in this picture represent Jesus. 
and we'll put up the Samaritan woman here. And Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman and he extends faith, which we'll represent with this line. This is faith. He extends faith to the Samaritan woman and she receives, she accepts that faith. And then once she has that faith, what does she do? She goes and she extends faith to the townspeople. Now, at this point, this is affiliating faith. And, and I love doing this. Uh, if, if this was live and we were in a class setting, I would actually have, I've got these little short ropes. And if you're teaching this as a class, you may want to do this. And just, you can physically have a person be Jesus and one be a Samaritan woman, extend faith to her, and then she extends faith out to others. And then you can kind of visualize what affiliating faith looks like. Now, almost all of us come to Christ this way. You came to Christ through a, a parent or another family member or a minister or a friend or somebody, some affiliation. We all come to Christ this way. And it's fine to come to Christ this way, but we don't want to stay in this position. So look at the picture here closely. What is wrong with staying in the situation? Well, you'll notice everything that the townspeople learn about Jesus, they, it's filtered through the Samaritan woman, which could be wrong. This is how false doctrine gets started, really, because people just accept something because of what somebody else tells them. They don't really receive it from Jesus and search it out directly from Jesus. Another problem with this is that the Samaritan woman is in a position because these people are dependent on her, she can't really grow as much in her relationship with Christ. And if we had the ropes, what I do is I ask them, well, I ask the townspeople, test your faith. And while they're pulling on the rope and testing it, her focus is on them and not on Jesus. And that illustrates what happens a lot of times. This is where burnout takes place in ministry because this person in the middle has people that are dependent on them so much that they can't really grow in their relationship with God and their relationship with their personal relationship with God uh, shrinks down to a point they're not able to sustain the relationships with others. And that's what burnout is all about. Another problem with this situation is this Samaritan woman, she can't reach out to others. Here's one of the best evangelists and she has her hands full because she is trying to keep these other people coming and doing well. And so it limits her in her outreach. Now you might look at this and say, but, but the townspeople, they're free to reach out. Yes, they are, but they're not likely to. My research has shown that people with affiliating faith are not likely to share their faith with others. And why is that? Because their faith is not deep enough. It's just based on affiliation. They're not really plugged in directly to Jesus. They're not really motivated as much to share their faith. And so because of this, evangelism stops. Another problem with this, what if the Samaritan woman moves away or worse, falls away? Then what happens to these people? Well, they're gonna struggle to get back up and get plugged into Jesus. So it's okay to come to Christ this way, but we certainly don't want to stay in this position. Let me show you in this next slide what it should look like. Each person needs to be plugged directly into Jesus. And so this is the goal, is to get everyone to Christ, to mature everybody to the point they are searching out, just like these townspeople did, where you get to the point where you say, we don't just believe because of what you said, we've heard him for ourselves. We know that this is the Messiah. So that's affiliating faith. All right, a couple of points about that. Affiliate faith, as I said, is how most of us come to Christ. That's fine, but it's not good for us to stay there. We need to make sure that we mature, that we go on. Another thing I want to say about this, if, you've ever, if you're wondering so far, well, maybe do I have affiliate faith? Well, here's the acid test. If you believe what you believe because others believe it, you have affiliate faith. That's how you know. So if you can just be honest with yourself and say, okay, here's the things I believe. Why do I believe those things? Well, it's because that's what I was told. If that's the answer, then you have affiliating faith. If you believe what you believe because others believe it, you have affiliating faith. 
All right, let's talk about the next one, searching faith. So the example of searching faith, let's go back to the book of Acts. This time chapter 17. So searching faith is just what it sounds like. It's where we go on and we search and we say, okay, I, it's not good enough that I believe this because others have said this. I want to own this for myself. I want to know, is this really what the Bible says? Is this really God's will? Is this what he wants me to teach and believe the rest of my life? I need to search this out. We have an example of this in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 10. It says, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these, meaning the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. And so here is the example of searching faith. These Bereans, when they would hear Paul and Silas as they were preaching, say, now where was that passage? Was that in Numbers? We, we want to check that out. And they would search the scriptures daily. They were examining the scriptures every day to see if what Paul and Silas were teaching was correct. This is obviously what searching faith is. It's when we're at that point that we search out. We need to allow searching faith in the church and parents. Special note to you, let your kids search out their faith. I know it is hard because it looks like doubt, but if your, children, if your child is starts searching, you need to let them do that and, and encourage them actually in that. Because if not, they're going to do one of three things. They're going to look for another church where they can search out their faith when they're out on their own. Or they're going to fall back to a failing of faith and stay there the rest of their lives. And we have many church members that are in that position. Or they'll abandon their faith altogether. Now, which do you want your child to do? If you're like me, it's none of the above. And so let your child search, encourage them to search. Obviously, you don't want them to, to search the occult or, or something crazy like that, but encourage them to search and to own out their faith for themselves. Applaud them when they are doing that. Don't discourage your children from searching out their faith. Solidifying faith is our next one. Number four, who is the example of solidifying faith? Well, Timothy. Timothy is a great example. Timothy did not quite have mature faith. He still needed to solidify the faith that he had. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy and look at what Paul says to the younger Timothy, starting in verse 5. For I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Paul says, Timothy, I know you well. I knew your grandma. I know your mom. All of you have wonderful faith. You have it too. I see that in you. Now I want you to kindle afresh what is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, Paul was an apostle. And he's most likely talking about a miraculous ability that he was able to pass on to Timothy. But nevertheless, the idea of kindling, I, I grew up in the mountains where in Colorado where we had to kindle the fire. And I remember many times trying to get a fire started and, and you, you get a little bit of a, a spark going and you have to blow on it. You have to, to give it a little breath and and make that flame grow. And that's what Paul is telling you to me. He says, I, I see the flicker there. I see a little bit of fire. Now we need to kindle that. We need to make that a bigger fire. In other words, you need to, to develop. You need to solidify, Timothy. The things that you've heard me say, now you need to check out. You need to make that solid. You've searched these things. Come down solid on your faith. This is where you need to be. Last one to look at is mature faith. And for this, we've got to look at Paul in Acts chapter 27. Go back one more time to the book of Acts. So many passages we could look at that demonstrate Paul's mature faith, but this is one of my favorites 
In Acts chapter 27, I'll start reading in verse 21. And the, the context is, is they are on the ship, they're headed to Rome, and Paul with many others are caught in a very fierce storm and they're in fear for their lives. And it says in verse 21, when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet, now I urge you to keep your courage for there will be no loss of life among you, only the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. So much in that, just in that one passage about Paul's faith. But my favorite part is when he says, last night, the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Listen, you get straight who you belong to and who you serve, and you're going to have mature faith. Paul was an example of mature faith. He was not perfect. I want to reiterate that. Mature faith is not perfection, but he was very mature. And look at all the things that Paul went through. There was no way to dissuade him in his faith. He was rock solid in his faith. That's what we want to get to, is getting to that point that we have mature faith. There's imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, and mature faith. Please memorize those. We're going to be talking about those. We'll go through each one individually. I really want to get you to the point that you have endless faith. No matter what happens, your faith endures. I want you to have fearless faith so that fear doesn't get in and dissuade you and, and pull you away from God. We want to have a mature faith. And so together, let's reach, let's reach new levels of faith. Hope to see you in the next class. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you next time.